Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2019 of Warsaw, Poland. Our next speaker will be giving his fourth ever presentation at the 21 Convention live event. His first one being in Orlando, Florida, way back in 2011. He spoke later in 2012 in Austin, Texas, and at our 10-year anniversary special event in Orlando, Florida, 2017. He's an author for many years, many years, over well over a decade at freetheanimal.com, and he is the man responsible for this, for this hat being on my head. Without further ado, please help me welcome back to the stage, Richard Nikolai. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, gentlemen, it is fun to be here. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have not yet partaken of a chunk of meat the city has to offer? All right, no hands up. Yeah, because I was going to, uh, I was going to presumptuously give a little bit of a uh, addendum to Jack Donovan's uh, speech, a way of men, you got to have your meat, you know, got to eat your chunks of meat. So we're here in Poland, and as Anthony said, I've spoken, this will be my fourth time, and not taking away uh, anything from the other 16 events, uh, I'd like to say that, man, this place is the right time at the right place. Right place at right time. I, I got, that, got that backwards. So, a um, little note of appreciation for our, for our hosts. What a great country, you know. I am just really enjoying it here. How about yourselves? Is this just, yes. And another note of appreciation goes out to uh, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson himself. Um, 17th, what a movement he's created. And everybody knows about, you know, the drama that's taken place over the past few months, which Socrates in the kickoff presentation yesterday framed it very well. Uh, I want to add one thing to that, is all of that drama just shows how needed this men's movement is that Anthony is driving forward. Little round of applause for our host here. Yeah. I mean, I saw so much girly behavior in the reactions for that. It was just, it's like, wow, this is more needed now than ever. Okay, so let's uh, jump into it. Let's see how this works here. As he said, I'm Richard Nikolai. There's two ways to find me online, freetheanimal.com, facebook.com, richard.nikolai. So let's start with doing a big justification. Let's do a 30,000 foot view here. That's the way it used to be. Classic, and I could, you could use a, you know, get any Renaissance painting, for example. You know, you'll find stuff like this. The men, the woman, the family, in their traditional roles there, right? And um, you're gonna hear a lot I'm going to reference this a lot. A lot of people have heard um, this thing called the slippery slope. How many have heard about the slippery slope? Right? The slippery slope fallacy. It, what it is is that if uh, you know, someone proposes uh, uh, an idea to change an idea and someone raises an objection and says, oh, no, you do that, then it's going to go to this, and going to go to this, gonna, you slide down the slippery slope. It's called the slippery slope fallacy. It's not a formal fallacy, but it's uh, because it's not really technically an argument against an idea, but people use it a lot. Well, <clears throat> I have, there's so many instances now where I look around and I say, wow, it's not the slippery slope fallacy. It's a slippery slope fallacy fallacy. In other words, it's a fallacy in itself because I see so many things that have slid all the way down. 
So if we're talking feminism, slid all the way down. If you can see the picture, it's a, you know, what, one, two, three, four, five, you know, tattooed, pierced sluts, essentially, right? Feminists, yeah. Anti-man, anti-woman, anti-family, anti-civilization. All right, I'm gonna take this history of feminism, feminism, break it into four things. Emancipation, we'll get into each individual, but there's, uh, there's what it's going to be. We're just gonna, you can break it up into however many you want, but we're gonna do four. <clears throat> now, I, I was searching around and I stumbled on this, uh, this website called historyoffeminism.com. It's no longer updated. It, was you know a few years back in 2013 14 but i thought man there's some pretty good quotes in there so i stole a couple feminism exists as a defender of the selfish sexual and reproductive interests of aging and or unattractive women right <clears throat> this is its entire raison d'etre reason for being the reason it first came into existence with the social purity movement reformers of the 19th century, led by their Herodin battle cry, armed with the ballot, the mothers of America will legislate morality, and indeed they have. Okay, now, so let's, let's look way back. I mean, you can find the first references to, you know, sort of um, um, emancipation of women, what I'm going to call emancipation of women. Um, and when we talk emancipation of women, we're talking, you know, uh, you know like ancient cultures where, where that, that still exist to, to, uh, to some extent in some parts of the, of the world or religions of the world, I should say, without naming names, where women are essentially property. You know, they can be bought and sold. They can be killed. They can be raped. Right? As a matter of law. All right, so, um, so I'm calling this valid. I, I mean, we don't, want, we don't want women to be treated that way. So um, adult women, they're no longer property, as I was saying. And then we have certain things like with the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment, where we start to wake up to the values of women in society as more or less equal at least in a social marriage setting with their spouses, right? And they become a focus of art. Look at, so, look like that first one where I put up, there's so, so many Renaissance works of art where the, where the woman is really given an exalted status as, you know, mother. And, um, you know, and some of our Western religions, you know, celebrate women and, and we celebrate nature as mother nature, right? So all of these ideals, that came about from something that was pretty much like a slavery situation before. And then, you know, we have the Victorian era where women become a target of gentlemanliness. I mean, that's why gentlemanliness, you know, came about really. Although, you know, men are gentlemen to one another as well, but it's in a different context. And also chivalry, women and children first, right? Where did that come about? So these are basic emancipation things uh, for women, and I say that that's a good thing, right? But <clears throat> then we go to pressure and control the competition, which goes to motivation. Okay, so what, when, when, when the whole Feminine. Remember this, the slide with the long quote about how um, it was a way for women who are getting older, less desirable, to start controlling the marketplace. So you have things like uh, advocacy for restrictions on prostitution. They don't, want, uh, they don't want their guys having access to sex in that way. They raise the age of, con age of consent from 12 to 16, 18 in some places, right? And, and uh, um, restricting or closing, you know, traditional male outlets where males would get together with one another because, you know, they might often be served 
by, you know, cute girls, cute females, right? Okay, so <clears throat> the next step in the history is equality under the law. And remember, you know, the emancipation, I said valid. This I'm going to call it mixed, you know. Some's good, some's okay, some's not so good, right? So basic education, I call that good, you know. We want women to uh, be versed in the three R's, read and write and arithmetic, right? Um, there's no reason why they should not be able to have contracts like men can. No reason they shouldn't be able to own property. But these are basic human rights, really, right? And even separation of divorce rights, right? But not the slippery slope fallacy fallacy that it has become today. We'll talk about that more. Uh, suffrage. Now, I, I tend to think that the, uh, what was it, the 19th Amendment, um, which happened 100 years ago, I happen to think it's a disaster. But at the same time, the cat's out of the bag. You ain't going to do nothing about that, right? So in the, at the end of this, we'll have some practical things, I think, that can ameliorate the situation, right? Women aren't going to like to hear it, but there's none, there's none here, uh, at least as attendees. Um, sorry, Georgia's girlfriend. I see you back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, and then it creeps. Okay, now they can vote. So, of course, since they can vote, they're going to be holding political office, right? And what are they, what they, they going to tend to do when they hold political office? They're going to work for not family issues. Well, they call them that, right? They're going to work for their own interests that are separate from their husbands, from their parents, from their household, from even their children, right? They become judges. So now they get to the slope, start sliding, right? Judges, and um, so they get to essentially make law, set precedent over cases. And many, many of the family law courts are womaned by female judges now. How do you think that's going to work? Right? Um, and they've entered into uh, many traditional male roles in the workforce. And of course, the, the, the most prominent time when this began happening is with World War II. So think of that as a consequence of another, just another social consequence cost of war is you have all these women piling in. We're going to talk about the economic part of feminism here in just a bit. Well, a little while. And then, of course, since they're in the workforce, then eventually they're going to be managers in the workforce. Right? And um, how, many, how many of you have heard from women that say they cannot stand working for a female manager? All of us have heard that. <clears throat> okay, now, when we talk, I love this quote because when we talk about feminism and the way it works, I'm thinking, it's a trade, it's like a union, right? All for one, one for all. The history of feminism is the history of a female sexual trade union growing in political power in exact correspondence with the steady loss of female sexual power caused by the continual widening of the sexual market. The opening up of the sex market, the ever-increasing opportunities for men to gain access to cheap and anonymous sex is the result of constantly emerging new technology and is in itself completely out of the hands of feminists or anybody else to control or put a stop to. So a lot of these, um, a lot of these feminist uh, initiatives are thought to have actually um, uh, liberated women when the exact opposite has been the case in practice. Because what it has done is it's liberated men to have a much 
pick a, a higher, a, 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 big, a better uh, picking grounds, whatever. Think about it. You know, and, and, and it's not only feminism's fault, it's also just a consequence of modernity and, th you know, a guy used to be in, on, in a rural setting, like on a farm or in a small, you know, small town community. He couldn't screw around. <laughs> number one, everybody would know about it. And number two, whoever he's screwing around with, he risked getting killed by the, the uncles or the brothers of that, of that woman, you know. So uh, urbanization and all these things have, have really liberated men. And feminism is this effort to, like, you know, keep that, keep, keep the cat in the bag. The cat's out of the bag. All right. So that's the history. Now we have the cancer, and it has emerges, merged with, excuse me, metastasis or metastasis, however you wish to. Right. Metastasis is a path. <laughs> this, is, this is actually the true definition, but it, look how nicely it fits with the cancer of feminism. Metastasis is a pathogenic agent spread from an initial or primary site to a different or secondary site within the host body. And if you body politic, you know, society at large, the family and everything. It's, it's, it's infecting everything. The cancer is growing and it's metastasizing. Many of you, some of you maybe know Kurt Doolittle, propertarianism. Um, it's a, the female of our species, or more correctly, the female mind in our species, is extremely susceptible to individual psychosis and solipsism. Solipsism is the idea that whatever is in your mind is the reality. And even more so, herd panic, trend and consensus, and verbalizing those behaviors by drama, outburst, disapproval, shaming, ridicule, rallying, gossiping, and reputation destruction that never ceases. How's that for a mouthful? Love it. Because it's so apt. Every one of you have been in some sort of relationship, probably, when that strikes, that rings true to you. Okay. Just like with the history, I'm breaking the cancer of feminism into four things. Ideological, political, activist, economic, and market-driven. The ideological cancer, brain rot, it's brain tumor. It's cancer of the brain, right? Solipsism, as I just mentioned and defined in Kurt Doolittle's quote. It's the primacy of feelings and emotions. Now, it's, it's well known that, that men tend towards a more rash. They had to. It's, they had to run survival. For We evolved that way. You know, they have to understand you know, that that sky spells danger. Or those animal tracks spell danger. That, um, that smoke smells danger, right? that the migration of the species may spell danger. Where are they going? Why? Where are they coming from? Where are they going to? Why? It could, it could spell starvation. Men had to take care of this stuff, and they just, it didn't matter what they felt about it. Just didn't, right? But, and, and it's, it's, it's perfectly fine because of women's nurturing roles and everything that they tend towards a bit uh, more emotional, empathetic, and so on. They have children to raise, and it's, it's a task, and you have to deal with, I mean, kids are, are crazy emotional, right? So there needs to be some way to, somebody who's expert at it, I guess you could say, right? But the thing is, when they become primacy, it's, it's very much related to solipsism, you know? It's like, you, you ever hear women talk so often? It's like, well, I feel, I feel. You know, men are more likely to use words like, I think, or, or, or 
I judge. You know, judge is a perfectly, I judge this. I think this. I estimate this. Eschew the word feeling in your speech. I feel like, I just feel, I just feel. Use feelings for like, man, that steak made me feel really good. You know, or, um, or, or that movie made me feel really good. Something like that. Or this made me feel really bad. But these are just, these are just your own personal states. It's not what, how you feel about, uh, you know, the, what you have to do to survive doesn't matter. Um, I use this word a lot, hubris. That's probably one of the things that annoys me about feminism more than anything. You know, if you, know, if, if you say, well, I, I, I just feel this, I just feel this, you know, I desire this, I would like you to do this, da 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 da. That's fine. But, but having hubris about it is like, God damn it, I'm right. No, you're feeling, right? So that annoys me. So it comes down to, now self, everybody's selfish to some extent, and to some extent there's a virtue to that. Everybody needs to take care of themselves, right? Right? But there's, but there's like this, this, um, this tendency to what I call sacrificial. It's, it's selfishness that isn't just looking out for yourself to the extent that you should be, to keep yourself healthy, to keep your, your relationships healthy, and so on. Sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes you have to be a little selfish. It's a sacrificial selfishness where you're getting others to harm themselves for your benefit. You want them to sacrifice to your emotions, your hubristic desires, and your feelings. Because, God damn it, it's true. Because my mind thinks it. So that's the ideological part of, of feminism. And like I say, all of these things, all of these things might very well be, to some extent, just, just the way uh, the female is, just the way women are, right? It's the unbridled nature of it which feminism encourages and has it, it's like a chain reaction, blows out of control, the slippery slope fallacy fallacy. Okay, political cancer. <clears throat> too much is never enough. Now I started using these two phrases here, inch mile and the old have your cake and eat it too, right? Started using these quite some time back in reference to not just feminism, but a lot of, a lot of the leftist uh, political agenda, and it started resonating because I see other people uh, using it too. I think Anthony even used it in, in, uh, in an interview we did some, some months back, he referenced it. So it's like, it's, so it's, it, it's a just right, kind of a restatement of the whole slippery slope, fallacy, fallacy. I told you I was going to reference that quite a bit. So, you know, it's, so, so you give in, right? It's not good. Okay, great. They, no, they don't even thank you. There's no show of appreciation. It's like, well, no, it's not enough. We want this. You see it every day in the news. Have your cake and eat it too. So in other words, they don't want it. They don't, they, they, or they, they, feminism tends toward this kind of, there's no negotiation, right? We're going to have this, but we're not going to trade it off with anything else. We want it all. The song goes. And it's just never going to be enough. <clears throat> then there's the activist cancer, the worst part of feminism. It's puility, it's ugliness. It's just just off the off the top, ugly and bad, right? <clears throat> so we've gone from where, you know, the idea with suffrage, the 19th Amendment, is like, well, okay, if we, if, uh, if we as a family have these political, you know, ideals, whether we're, you know, more liberal or whether we're more conservative or whatnot, then, you know, there's two votes in the family instead of just one, right? But now it's gone to where <coughs> they vote, they vote 
they vote from voting in league with their husbands and family, you know, could be their, you know, their relatives other, as, as well, to replacing them with the government, right? So, uh, they, in other words, they're working at odds against their own traditional roles because feminism has told them that their traditional roles are bad and wrong, right? Abortion to infanticide. I mean, if you're, if you're in the U.S., you've seen all these states now passing laws. Basically, basically, you can slice up the baby as it's coming out of the womb, you know. So originally, abortion was like, hey, you know, sometimes there's tough situations. There's, there's rape and incest, which amount, by the way, to like less than 1% of all abortions uh, as a cause of rape and incest. So that's a big fat lie, right? Most of them are for convenience, right? Now, hell, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was supportive for a very, very long time, right? But I thought, okay, it's gonna be reasonable. I've even had girlfriends that had an abortion, you know? But in every single case, they had one, they had it very, when they were very young, young and dumb, and uh, they had it early, like it's pretty much as soon as they found out, and they never did it again, right? But now it's not enough, it's inch mile. So it's gotta be later and later and later and later to where even people like me, or even who are more liberal about it are saying, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. And then, and then you, have, you have these parade of feminists now who say, who say, I'm proud I had an abortion, or two, or three. And some even say, I wish I, 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 I wish I, uh, I never had an abortion. I sure, I wish I had, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> uh, so it's like, it's like the greatest thing in life you can do is have an abortion. I'm not going to get into, you know, when life begins, or, you know, fetus, or infant, or, killing or well it's a killing that's for sure but whether it's murder or, you know or but certainly it, you got to make you got to question when um where is this thing okay Let's see if i can oh, uh oh anthony help i messed it up sorry Very sorry. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about that. I won't mess with it again. All right. So now, you know, again, as a, as a modern society, we wouldn't want to be in a situation where, well, you know, once you get married, you're stuck for life, no matter what a bitch she is, no matter what an asshole he is, right? So legitimate means to dissolve um, these divorces is certainly a modern civilizational thing to do, and an emancipation for both men and women so that you're not locked into a relationship that you just hate for life, right? But it's gone f from that to where, <coughs> where the, 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 leg, the legalities involved have evolved to where um, it's initiated. Most divorces, it, what are we, it's about half of marriages in the U.S. Uh, end in divorce. And the vast majority of those, I think, I think it's upwards of 70% of the divorces are initiated by women. And oftentimes, they're initiated because she can cash in, Right? Uh, it's called divorce rape, or you call it man rape, you know. She can, with child support, alimony, and all these other, uh, other laws, right, she can, she can really go to town. So that's another where the slippery slope fallacy fallacy is gone. And so if you, if you have a divorce and there's kids involved, right, you, you know, some sort of shared custody would, would certainly be a good idea so that the kids get to see both, both parents, right? 
but it's but in so many cases it's evolved into it's slid down into what's pretty much kidnapping now with the with the help of the family courts run by feminist women sitting on the benches right all comes what goes around comes around and employment too you know we're going to talk about women in the workforce but um and so and that's another emancipate well if a woman wants to work why not letter and, and she should be able to advance in the company and so on and so forth right but then with the employment laws the sexual harassment da, 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 all driven by feminists so it's gone from you know a basic at will employee employment right yeah i want you until i don't want you and da, 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 da. then she gets to concoct some some you know <laughs> some excuse about sexual harassment so employing in many cases for many companies employing women is, is tantamount to a tro to having a trojan horse and you're going to have uh, treason from the inside um in 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 similar vein to uh to what recently happened with the 21 drama right okay so there's to sum that up from you know, just beautiful, classy women to the ranting pussy hats. Yeah. What a great legacy, right? I, so I just shortened this presentation by a thousand words. All right. Now, interesting little anecdote here, personal anecdote. Paul Stiles wrote this book in 2005. Is the American Dream Killing You? And Paul's an old Navy buddy of mine. In fact, uh, Monday after I leave here, I'm gonna, he lives in Spain. I'm gonna meet up with him and we're gonna hike around in the Alpujarra of Southern Spain for, uh, for a week. So my next section here is built on chapter two of this book. <clears throat> Here's the opening paragraph. It's 1950 and the market is not happy. From the summit of the economic system, it stares down upon America with a jaundiced eye. America's most important resource, its labor force, is incredibly unproductive <clears throat> for one simple reason. Most women aren't employed. Homemakers work, of course, but they don't get paid for it, which means they add nothing to the GDP, gross domestic product, and without a salary, very important, and without a salary, the market has no control over, you know, bear with him, he's anthropomorphizing the market here, clearly, but it's for an effect, it's to create an illustration. Without a salary, the market has no control over them at all. The market cannot fire them, promote them, or move them to where it needs them the most. All devoid of relationship with a man, relationship with the with, uh, kids, the family unit. <sighs> They're basically off the economic grid. What an enormous opportunity cost. Meltdown, the market versus the nuclear family. That's the title of his chapter two in that book, Is the American Dream Killing You? <clears throat> it's, if you look at it, when women started entering the workforce and you start sizing up from that last quote when they got into the market when they became productive productive members of a society that can be accounted for in terms of gross domestic product dollars and cents productivity right keeping up with the joneses now it's a bigger possibility you know, both parents working, um, about two thirds or more of women work, and most of them work full time. So, what kind of pressures does this cause put on the family, right? So, if you compare it to where, in you know, a traditional uh, family, dad goes to work. Mom stays home, makes a home. That's why they call them homemakers. She took care of the kids. All this serves 
so that the husband can, he, that, she's got it handled. I can focus on my work or my business, whichever the case may be. I can advance in my career because I don't have these other pressures. I don't, she's got it handled. She's great. So I get to advance in the career. So I make more my business. I make more money, make more money. And soon it, it was silly that we'd ever considered that she would work. Now he's bringing in plenty of money so that if they're frugal, they can work, they can have a household. They can have a household. But the, 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 the economy needs women. Because when women went to work, imagine all of the new industries that had to crop up for the sake of productivity and a growing economy. You know, you have, you have to have more dry cleaners. You have to have, you know, ready to eat meals. You have to have instant this and instant that. You have to double automobile production because now you have to have two cars. All of this benefits the economy. Oh, we're so, it's great. Look at, look at how much our account, economy is growing. At what cost? The cost of the family, the family unit. Think about it. Think about all the things, you know, service businesses. Now you have to have carpet cleaners and window washers. We could, go, we could make lists all day long about what you need to have so that you have a robust, growing economy that's the envy of the world. Well, our family units aren't the envy of the world. There's a, there's a, there's a hell of a lot of poor countries who don't envy our families. So all this thing breaks a lot of traditional bonds. It breaks the marital bond, right? She's at work, he's at work. They come home, they both come home. They're both stressed out, right? Instead that she gets to, she gets to, she, she has kind of her, she's like her in business for herself, her own business, homemaker. Hmm? She gets to run that. She gets to run that, everything's calm. She's got everything handled. She knows how to deal with every situation. She's got no boss, not in a real sense, right? Especially if she's good. <laughs> she's actually gonna have a client. It's called her husband, right? <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and then he comes home and instead of a traditional role where he comes home to a refuge that she has created so he can go, whew, kick back, leave the work at the work, enjoy this refuge so that when he goes the next day, he's, he's ready to pop on it again because he's not stressed. He's not pissed off, you know, because they got home and all they could do is, you know, and she was late, you know, Take some TV dinners out of the freezer, you know. Let's sit in front of the TV, watch them. Uh, uh, get, give the kids an iPad to babysit them. <clears throat> in this sense, uh, 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 Paul calls it uh, the Wall Street marriage, you know. It's almost like a merger, and marriage is a merger and acquisition. It's like, you know, guys are like, Oh, she, I, I want to marry her because she makes a good salary. We'll be able to get more stuff. You know, it's, and it was perfectly fine for women to say, well, I want to marry him. He, he makes a good salary. He's got a secure job I, that makes me feel safe and secure. That's a valid thing for a woman to feel. And worst of all is the parental bond. 
you don't have the one parent, even if you're in a non-traditional where the woman works and the, and the dad's at home. That's better than both of them being off at work. And then they got, come home, they're pissed off because they don't have a great relationship. And the kids are annoying. Kids are at each other's throat. Sit down in the TV, TV babysitter. And now, here's an iPad. You don't even know what your kids are doing on it because you don't know how to work all those parental controls. <clears throat> and, then, and then, you know, for the little tykes, you know, the hatchery and conditioning center, which the conditioning center goes on and on and on, right? Because, because only kooks homeschool their kids. Only kooks who, where the husband works and the wife stays at home, and she's, she's a homemaker and a school teacher both. And she collaborates with other similar um, women. So they kind of have their own little cottage school, right? No, nope, send them to daycare. And then when that's done, send them to school babysitting for indoctrination. So you see how our demand to have a robust and growing economy that's the end of the world comes at a huge cost. And feminism, that's where, where it becomes what's called market feminism, right? That's, so, you know, feminism isn't all, only about the ideology it isn't only about the solipsism. It isn't only about the, the, the man, the, the, the misandry, the man-hating. It's, it's partly about that. But it's also partly about being a shareholder in this great economy. You're an actual shareholder now, right? Stakeholder, shareholder, right? Where to now? Where do we go? Now, this is the practical part of the thing. You know, can't repeal the 19th Amendment. That's just silly, you know. We can't, there's a lot of laws that are already there that are just gonna be there. You just have to contend with them. So it's about education, right? Who goes first? The guys. Because you've got to take responsibility. Somebody's got to step up and take some responsibility. Okay, what, what, ha, what do men do to help turn this around, at least, at least in their own lives? Attend 21 convention events and subscribe to watch the many, many videos. Now, that's a second or third plug for Anthony so far today. So. <laughs> All right. I've been saying this for years. Don't, to, to young people, don't go to college. Get a job or start a business. You know, unless, you, unless you're like some STEM genius or you want to be a surgeon or something like that. You know, you're probably going to need some schooling then. All right. You imagine you save, all, the student debt is crazy. Imagine if you just got out of high school or even you dropped out of high school. Right? As soon as you have a good idea, you test it and like this can work. I mean, you can be you can be a millionaire by the time these other idiots are getting out of college with 250k in student loan debt. Right? Be financially frugal, huge lesson for young people to learn. And if you have parents, how are they going to learn that when their parents are stupid enough? to both be grinding the bone, destroying the family. What kind of, what kind of financial frugality are the kids going to learn from that? <clears throat> Do it like they did in the old days. The guy saves money so he can get married and start a family. Imagine that. How outlandish. How old-fashioned. How silly. All right. Marry a young woman who wants to have and raise kids and is from such a family and holds such family values. Do not marry a woman who has, and this is the first profanity I'm going to use, do not marry a woman that, has, that comes from a fucked up family unless 
she's very outlier and special and knows exactly what screwed up and why it screwed up and, do, and wants to marry a good man because she doesn't want to repeat that cycle. But that's going to be rare. <clears throat> then you live within your means that allow her to stay home, to raise kids, and support your career or business growth and advancement. This is about maturity. This is about what Socrates talked about yesterday, this, this uh, manosphere, this red pill movement, gr maturing out of, you know, just getting your willy wet, you know, into taking some real manning up, taking some real man responsibility. Got to have man friends. Noah's going to talk about that, I bet. Um, you you got to have man friends, but you want to develop bonds with other family men, even if you're not yet, so that you know how to do it before you've actually done it, right? Leave the boys to the boys. Just, you know, get serious, get serious, take on responsibility, marry a good woman, have a family. It's like humanity 101, man humanity, humanity 101. Okay, I'm glad there's no women here. Shut up already. <laughs> now, this is slightly tongue in cheek, expressly because it's not a mixed audience. So, t slight tongue in cheek, but not too much, right? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, not necessarily shut up, but you know, listen. You know, that's a better way to put it. Listen, listen to what these feminists are saying. Listen to what they're trying to get you to do. Listen to what you're being encouraged to do and assess how compatible it is with having a good relationship with a responsible man and a great family that you have made a home for. So listen to who's encouraging you to do what. And the reason I'm saying you is because I'm sure women are gonna, once this gets up on the, on the, on the web, women are gonna be seeing this uh, presentation. So I do want to be constructive, ladies. So root out the drama. I know you can't root it out completely. Root out the drama, outburst, disapproval, shaming, ridicule, rallying, gossiping, and, re and re reputation destruction of your husbands. And if you recall, that's from Kurt Doolittle's quote that I put up earlier. <clears throat> Look up gaslighting and learn it and stop it. Be a stay-at-home mom with only other women friends who are stay-at-home moms who support the careers and businesses of their husbands. You don't get women friends. You get together and, 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 and you compare what a lout each other's husband is. It's like the victim Olympics. Who, 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 who wins by having the worst husband that you chat about? Very undermining, very destructive. Now a trigger warning here. Vote the way your husband tells you to or don't vote at all. One family, one vote. And there's your solution to the 19th Amendment problem, incidentally. Right? And look, you can even make a deal with your husband. If we can't agree on uh, to, you know, you can negotiate. Right? That's another kind of tongue-in-cheek. I'm not saying don't discuss it. Don't negotiate. Maybe you can have throwaway issues. Like, and if the husband is clever, let's, let's the, has the wife vote against him on all these you know, silly things that don't matter, right? But you vote the same. Or agree to both not vote, if you can't agree. <clears throat> but, th and this is the important one. Never ever vote for public policy that undermines men as husbands and fathers or undermines families in general. I, I mean, it's the stupidest thing. Well, I can vote, 
right? So I'm going to vote about this and this and this. Well, you know, look at any chart. I should have put a chart up here about social, the, so, the, the creeping socialism, uh, the slippery slope fallacy, fallacy of, of socialism. Uh, it's like, oh, it's never going to get that bad. Well, look at, look at where it really starts to take off 100 years ago with the 19th Amendment. Because that's when, that's when feminism got its first major huge victory. And from then on, women have voted for socialist policies that replace their fathers, their husbands, their grandfathers, their uncles, their brothers, who were their support networks, and even, hell, even, even their local community churches and and whatnot, that were, that were a woman's, you know, safety net. Because she likes that safety and security, right? It's like, ah, screw it. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna have society in general do it for me. All right. Well, okay. Well, then, then what happens? It's like, oh, well, that's not quite enough. I want to be able to divorce rape my husband and kidnap the kids. Okay, then what happens? Yeah, the, it, the progression, the slippery slope sliding all the way down. Okay, here's a caveat bone toss for the ladies out there. The women who are red pilled before boyfriends and husbands. Well, if your boyfriend's not, if you're red pilled and your boyfriend isn't red pilled, I'm going to change that. Get rid, dump him. Go find a red pilled boyfriend. Or if you, but if your if your if your husband isn't the soy boy, feminist, socialist, whatever, uh, then now fourth, uh, fourth shout out to Anthony, you need to refer them to the Twenty One Empire, incenter right away, get them there and find other people, even find any of the any of the past speakers, find somebody, who can talk some sense into this guy, right. I thought I wasn't going to give you the def definition. Gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation that seeks to sow seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or in members of a targeted group, making them question their own memory, perception, and sanity. Using persistent denial, misdirection, contradiction, and lying, it attempts to destabilize the target and legitimize the target's belief. That's kind of a form of all, this, all these traits that we talked about that, that women tend to have when they get blown out of proportion by a cancer like feminism. There we go. I think we have a few minutes here if any, um, anyone has a, a question or two. Uh, for stay-at-home moms, what do you think if she's a school teacher? Take, uh, start a school teaching business in the neighborhood. Uh, incidentally, uh, my former wife was a 35-year school teacher. I understand the value of it. She was good. Um, I, when I first met her uh, 20 year, 25 years ago, it was very common we were out and about in town for these big guys, she'd been teaching by then, by like 18, 20 years, right? Fifth grade, sixth grade. And she had these big guys run up to her and give her a big hug. That's how well liked she was. Happened, happened very frequently. But, you know, we're, we're trying to, we're tra what we're trying to do here is to like not only halt the tide, but we want, to, we want to get something back. We want to rebuild families. And there's many ways to do it, right? So I'm, I'm offering, I could have designed this in any way, but I wanted a very general view. So you kind of have a sense of, well, how do we get here, all right? And then the practical side of what some of the things we can do about it. But my lists aren't, aren't, all, aren't exhaustive. You know, anyone can have great ideas. I, I, I welcome them. Anyone else? 
other questions? Any Thank other? Oh, there's one. Yeah, just curious. Um, you know, with the uh, the the suffrage issue, mm -hmm. um, I agree what with what you say in terms of either you know voting along with um, the uh, the male partner or or simply not. Um, you know, a lot of voices in the MegTal community are you know they're constantly chirping on about taking away that suffrage right. Um, do you think that's 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 feasible in this? No, no, I, I mentioned that in the press. It's, it's just, it's non-starter as an idea. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like people who dabble in conspiracy theories, which I call secrets too big to keep. Um, and, it, you know, people who deal in political activism at fringes. I mean, it's tantamount to saying, well, let's repeal the 16th Amendment and have slaves. It's just not going to happen. Right? Even, if, even if you're pro-slavery, it it's just dumb. So what you have to do is do, some, do stuff that's actionable, that you can take responsibility for and, and put some of these actionable elements into play that actually get some results that you can measure. Right? <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, so I have a, this question about this. When you talk about the ideology, ideological cancer like solipsism and feelings over facts yes. and so on, and you talk that that's a female way of thinking, but I noticed that's exactly the way that the radicalized left and the social justice warriors, that's exactly how they think and they feel and they act, but there are also a hell of a lot of men in those groups. Oh, yeah. So what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I agree 100% with you. Um, there, there's, you know, when I say feminism, I'm not saying women. I'm saying feminism. It's an ideology. And you, you, have, you have tons, tons of these, you know, soy boys, beta boys, pussy boys, whatever you want to call them. And it, that's a growing thing, too. It's, it's awful. I mean, it's actually worse, really, in some, in some respects than the, than, the fem than the females. Because females are just, they're, they're kind of operating from their own basic survival strategy. It's just blown way out of proportion. And it's, and it's so uh, rewarded in society. But there's no damn excuse for men doing it. Absolutely none, right? We should bring, here's, should bring hanging back. Since we're talking about the 19th Amendment and slavery, and let's bring hanging back. <laughs> All, right, All right, anyone else? All right, let's give it up. Yep, okay, good. For Thank Richard Nikolai.